Hello again. My name is Caitlin Azro, and I'm a FinTech Policy Advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco. I've been with you throughout this conference as MC, and it is my pleasure to now shift to moderator for this fascinating panel that is central to my own research. My area focuses data, in particular, understanding potential trade-offs between capturing the value of data while also ensuring that information is protected and individual privacy upheld. I'm gonna lay a brief foundation for this discussion, introduce my great panelists, and then jump into the conversation. So overall today, our ability to collect and use data is constantly expanding. Information is both an economic resource for businesses and entire countries, as well as something very sensitive and personal to individuals that can create new and unique risks if it's breached or misused. So this dual nature of information means that it can help achieve country goals around inclusion, competition, and more, while also posing new risks around security, bias, and potentially new forms of exclusion. So the goal of this panel is to explore the potential for market level systems and resources that could help companies, and again, countries, strike this balance between using information while also protecting it and upholding new forms of individual rights. Furthermore, Given the unique expertise of central banks in providing market level systems like payments, could central banks themselves play a larger role in managing information? Or in many countries, they already are. So we're joining me for this discussion are three panelists with deep expertise in this area. First, David Medine, currently a consultant to CGAP or the Consultative Group to Assist the Poor, where he focuses on data protection and cybersecurity. David has over 25 years of experience in privacy and consumer financial services and has held positions at the SEC, CFPB, and FTC. Next is Sapnendu Moanti, Chief FinTech Officer for the Monetary Authority of Singapore, where he is responsible for creating strategies, public infrastructure, and regulatory policies around technological innovation. He has spent over 20 years in leadership roles globally across technology, finance, and innovation. Finally, Siddharth Shetty is a fellow at iSpirit Foundation, a nonprofit technology think tank. At iSpirit, he works on the India stack with a focus on utilizing digital infrastructure to solve problems in financial inclusion. In particular, he works on India's data empowerment and protection architecture, as well as the public credit registry run by the Reserve Bank of India. So thank you all for joining me so much. Um, to jump in, can you each briefly describe the unique proposal or situation in your countries, Singapore and India, um, that touches on this topic of central banks potentially providing new um, functions around data? Uh, so I'll start with David first. Uh, thanks, Caitlin. Pleasure to be with all of you. Um, so I wanted to focus on the threat posed by um, cyber attacks um, on the financial system. Uh, the financial sector, particularly in developing countries, has seen an increasing number of attacks from cyber criminals. We're seeing it in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Pacific, Latin America. Um, and these um, uh, attacks, if successful, could um, harm financial inclusion efforts by undermining trust and confidence in financial systems. And of course, the poor are at least able to afford losses to cyber criminals um, and are becoming more reliant on uh, mobile money, so a denial of service attack that takes it down could really impede people's lives. Um, the attacks also could be used as an entry point um, from small and medium firms in developing countries to attack the global financial system. Um, the International Association of Securities Commission said that cyber risk is a significant threat to the integrity, efficiency, and soundness of financial markets worldwide. Um, so what we need is a ecosystem approach to uh, combating cyber crime but the problem is oftentimes no single government entity is charged with responsibility for the entire financial sector. <clears throat> There's also a lack of, of access to affordable cybersecurity um, services, and we know that there's a global talent shortage of cyber experts. Um, and cyber uh, smaller countries <clears throat> can't afford cyber centers on their own. Um, so what we've come up with at CGAP is a proposal to create regional cybersecurity resource centers so that small, a number of smaller countries could share centers and get, get efficiencies of scale, uh, have a critical mass to meet demands. The centers could share threat information, um, provide early warnings to attacks, um, provide guidance on smart regulation on cyber um, that focuses on risks and not being unduly prescriptive. Um, do business and consumer education, because that's obviously 
critical in preventing cyber attacks <clears throat> and um, promote cross-sector cross, um, collaboration. So what is the central role of central banks in this effort? I think it's three parts, champion, coordinator, and cheerleader. Um, as a champion to promote um, cyber centers um, and, and where possible mandate their use um, in their country. As coordinator is to work with regional central banks um, to help create cyber centers um, and make use of them. And then as cheerleader uh, to make sure both the traditional financial sector of banks as well as MFIs, fintechs, embedded financial services and others all get on board with the, the critical task of combating cyber criminals. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, so, Saab, maybe you can continue the conversation a little bit if you describe the, the EKYC utility that MIS has been working on and the potential role um, of your organization uh, in data. Sure. Uh, look, there's a broader context to this discussion because in Asian market, in ASEAN market in particular, if you look at last two years, within between the 10 countries, close to 20 plus new digital bank license has been issued. Why this license are being issued? Because ASEAN market in particular believes that there's a huge shift to a digital economy. And to get into a digital economy, you need a very different kind of financial services, which is we call it the digital bank licensed entities. Now, you can't have a digital bank uh, license uh, entity, which is riding on a processes which are old-fashioned incumbent uh, stripe type processes of onboarding customers or moving money. So there is a need for a public rail for this country, which is a precursor for these licenses to be, to be issued. And the public rails are in the business of providing three things. Ability to, uh, in, uh, to ensure and identify consumers in the financial systems are verified uh, as per the KYC requirement. Second, once the customers get onboarded, they should be able to move money in the most cheap, affordable, cheapest, safe, and secure way. And third, any any any, any uh, uh, leverage of consumer data to provide a better financial services need a trusted source of data. And these are very fundamental rails required to build an ecosystem which is which believes that the future is with digital economy. Now, coming back to the KYC question. Today uh, in Singapore, we have a public utility called MyInfo. There are 40 plus data element out there, which are golden source data collected from residents by the government through different life cycle of the of the individual, whether at the at the point of getting born to going to college, uh, getting a house, buying a car. At every, every point of, of the life cycle, there are certain events which creates a trusted source of data, and that agency which collects the data contributes to the national infrastructure. Now, how does that help? For, for somebody to get a bank account in Singapore, all you have to do is to authorize and consent uh, the your access, uh, uh, the bank to pull data from the national infrastructure, and all the data bank needs to open account get pulled out within a minute, a, full less bank account gets opened. To me, that's the first thing fundamental uh, facility a country must have to facilitate a digital onboarding of customer. Uh, moving on to the second point of moving money safely. Today in Singapore, we have a national infrastructure called Pay Now. What it does, it allows two individuals with two bank account can so be able to send money to each other by just knowing their national ID or their mobile number. And within three clicks, zero cost money gets moved across account. And that's the rights on a national infrastructure. And the third aspect of, about um, uh, how, uh, how additional data set which the customer may have and how can different asset class, whether it's insurer or wealth managers or um, basic banking products being provided using the data the customer has. To answer that question, we are putting, we have, we are going to production by in a, in a month's time, which is called the National API Gateway. What it does, it pulls all the data I have in multiple banks, my liability asset data, which I can consent and get my, one of the uh, bank which I which I bank with to pull that all data and see a single view. And that's a public utility because I, because I consented banks to pull the data. 
Now, when you bring all this piece together, what it does, it allows individuals like me to have full control over my data, A, because I consent this data to be sent to this third party, in this case, bank. I also know what data I sent, when did I send, when I, after two years when I come back, I can always trace what, at what, when did I send this data. And that whole infrastructure today is available to us through our own uh, citizen portal. I think that's the way we think about the role of public rails, the role of public utility, and the greater good for the society when it comes to a broader economic construct. Thank you so much, Saab. Um, Sid, could you close us out? And I think one thing that's really interesting is um, Saab talked about this, this infrastructure and um, multiple layers. Uh, and I think India um, has, has taken a similar approach. So I'd love to learn about the uh, in data architecture and the public credit registry. Sorry, Sid, you're on mute. So the data empowerment and protection architecture uh, is actually the final layer of a collection of public uh, infrastructure called the India stack. Uh, it first started off with uh, Aadhaar, which was a national project uh, to give a digital identity to a billion Indians. And today, over a billion Indians have, have that, through which they can, in a low cost manner, authenticate themselves. Uh, this then allowed them to open bank accounts at scale. Uh, the second step that it was required is in India with over a billion people, hundreds of millions of whom are using smartphones, uh, they needed, and very low levels of discretionary income, uh, they needed a low cost mass market payment rails uh, using any consumer friendly app while retaining you know, the stability uh, that the traditional banking system offers um, uh, through the regulated uh, uh, banks. And that resulted in the creation of uh, a payment rail called UPI, uh, which today does billions of transactions a month. And that allows uh, any Indian to transact with each other or with any merchant um, uh, for a few rupees. Now, as these transactions got generated um, and connectivity started permeating deeper and deeper, uh, so Indians started adopting 4G technology, uh, what that resulted in was Indians were becoming data rich at an exponential pace. And this paradigm was very different from other developed markets, uh, where when the individuals became data rich, uh, their data was fundamentally used to shape their spending pattern because they already had higher levels of discretionary income. And so you would capture data about that individual or business and use that to personalize the ads and earn a commission on any ad, a uh, good or service bought through those ads. And that's a hugely profitable business model. Uh, but the same set of companies uh, uh, that operate in the Indian market, while they have some of their largest user bases out here, uh, draw relatively piddly amounts of revenue. Uh, and that's because at, at scale, Indians still don't have money to spend very low levels of per pack capita income. And therefore, we, it became in, uh, imperative to invert this entire paradigm where data, instead of being used to sell things to the user, is actually used to empower them. Uh, to access better financial services by eliminating the asymmetry gaps, uh, whether it pertains to asset or liability information, uh, bridge trust, access better health services, or any other service that socioeconomically uplifts them. To do that, we actually had to give every individual control of their data, uh, and that gets manifested through consent. Um, so what's now rolling out in India uh, through India Central Bank is essentially a consent framework that allows every individual to securely fetch and share their information um, in a decentralized way. So the data is never stored in one central repository and they can fetch a range of information across sectors. So banking, securities, insurance, pension fund, taxation, and electronically share this uh, with a lender, with a wealth manager, with a robo advisor, a range of uh, uh, financial information users uh, at a click of a button in an informed manner. And this is done through an ecosystem of entities uh, that create these diverse uh, user experiences. And a similar effort is also underway uh, in, through the public credit registry, which is essentially to build out real time uh, credit reporting in the country. So one of the ways a lender can actually reduce their risk is by reducing the tenure of the credit that they give. And for a population like India, where most of the Indians do not have a credit score, you need to have a mechanism to progressively uh, build up the credit profile. 
And so therefore, a key part of that is if you want to create these short term products, you need an infrastructure to report it. Let's say today the reporting cycle to a traditional bureau is a month to three months. If I need to give a one day loan or a one week loan and then increase it to two weeks and then four weeks, if the reporting happens after, you know, four months or, or three months, you know, you're going to have a lot of uh, over indebtedness take place in the system because the user will go out to multiple lenders and take a loan. And so therefore it became imperative to also build out the public credit registry uh, so that you could have real time reporting of this information and eliminate the asymmetry gaps to the next lender such that new financial products that are short ticket, short tenure, as you call it in India, sashitized, uh, could be created. And that becomes a stepping stone for individuals as they enter the financial system and they can progressively move up uh, and access uh, more larger formal products. Thank you. I think one thing that I'm um, noticing throughout, right, is I think in this conference as a whole, we're tying together a lot of the different functionalities of central banks. And both of you mentioned payments and, and how essential um, information is to kind of building these payment systems and identity systems. Um, I would like to open it up to anyone at this point and just ask if anyone disagrees with the framing of um, kind of data as its own resource to help build these systems. Um, and whether you think uh, central banks in particular have any unique capabilities. Well, I, 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 so look, I think uh, just to give a wider frame to your question, rather your your second question for the same question, saying that uh, is, the, is, the, is there any specific spatial roles uh, central bank plays in this process? At the end of the day, this is a highly regulated uh, industry. And there is a fear of liability ownership when you use certain data set. And, and, and having a, a, a system of data which is, which is in a way governed outside the central bank uh, uh, system creates the fear of, uh, of a liability uh, risk of anything goes wrong with the data. So that's one piece. Uh, I think that there's a need for a central bank quasi governance or some kind of partnership where there's a there's a shared blessing of the public utility to allow certain trust in using that platform especially the banks which are regulated by the central bank uh, so that's one uh, argument i will give in this in favor of a central bank role in this whole public infrastructure i guess that's the question you're asking right Caitlin? Uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the second aspect is trust now uh, there's a one way to argue that in many country you write an application straight on the internet I mean, i'm using very loosely word straight on the internet but there is a need to put something between the app and the internet and that's the four trusted rail which siddharth also spoke about which is id who you are on internet what data you carry with you is it trusted moving money on a trusted rail and a clear consent architecture so these are the four components which, which is between the app and the internet. And having that in the center in a more governed way allows a better trust systems on a digital economy where we don't see each other and we transact on trust. Yeah, I think um, I want to actually focus on that trust piece. Um, yeah, Sid, go ahead and then. Yeah, just to add on to uh, that, Caitlin, you know, uh, your question of data as a resource, I think we look at it, that, that there's a nuanced way to look at that. There's, you know, one view, which is data when viewed as a resource is a property. And then that takes people down the ownership path and then questions around, uh, you know, who owns the data? How do you price this? There are economic, you know, lack of economic models available around pricing data. Uh, and therefore, in India, we've taken a conscious call to view it um, actually on the other end. Uh, which is that because data is often co-created with platforms uh, and other technology systems and therefore uh, viewing data in a manner where the individual should have rights to access it, uh, to share it, to know what data has been captured about them and uh, have a safe, secure made to then, safe and secure mechanism to then share that downstream uh, versus the traditional methods where, you know, they either have to physically go and fetch their data uh, or digitally give out their username and password and it's screen scraped, uh, which is very primitive today. Um, uh, so that's just an additional way to look at uh, 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 data, at least how we've been looking at it. 
out here uh, in India. Can, can I add a couple of points? Um, one is uh, in terms of, of data protection, uh, many countries are developing data protection authorities, but I think the central bank plays an important role with them because there are specific contexts of financial services um, where when does someone become a customer? When do they cease becoming a customer? What about affiliates of the bank? Things that the general data protection rules may not address and a central bank can play an important role there in clarifying it. Uh, but in terms of how the system operates, I would challenge the consent aspect of it um, because uh, as we know, people don't read privacy notices. Um, they, don't, they click through whatever screens they need to to get to where they want to go. So I think it's important to not just rely on consent to protect people's data. Uh, even in the account aggregator or open banking context, um, consent is not enough. Um, and I think we need to have use restrictions so that uh, the data is only used for the purposes for which it was transferred and not for secondary purposes. I also think authentication is important in SOP. I think alluded to it, and not every country like India has a digital biometric I ID. Um, and in that case, you, um, you want to know who you're dealing with because if, if you give someone access to data and it's not the right person, it could cause tremendous harm. Um, and so I think um, cabining in consent and emphasizing authentication are both critical to giving consumers power to use their data um, uh, from prior experiences to get new credit or other, other opportunities. Absolutely. Consent should never, you know, just building on what David's point, consent does not absolve uh, the data processors uh, from accountability or responsibility around using it and not causing harm to the individual. And so while on one end, you cannot have lack of a consent framework because that implies that the individual has no agency over their data and choice. But at the same time, it's consent coupled with an accountability framework, which is what the central banks or the data protection authorities bring in. Uh, so that the data, you know, minimal data is accessed, it's used for the right purpose for which it was shared, uh, and so on. The, a quick, I think my response and consent for David is that I, I agree with David that clicking thousand, uh, like three pages of two size font doesn't make a great consent architecture. What we need and which I think we have practiced in Singapore is consenting what data set you have shared. When I say consent, it is a simple white screen with clear articulation of these are the four data you shared with this third party for this purpose on this date. That's to me is consent. The consent doesn't mean I'll, I'll click on four pages of legal protection lawyers have written, which makes no, no, no difference to myself. So to me, the consent is about what data we share as simply as, as, it, as it sounds and also the purpose at the point of transaction because there are implication on the same third party can go and do something else after a year time. At that point in time, you as a citizen have a right to withdraw the data because your, your original, the original purpose of collecting data is no more the same. So having a elaborate consent system facilitates a clear data consent strategy rather than blindly clicking into pages of documentation. Yeah, I completely agree uh, from from those of you who know my own research. So, you know, in this kind of architecture that uh, needs trust and maybe um, thinking about permissible use, like you mentioned, David, and, and upholding these types of consent frameworks, I want to move to enforcement or supervision. So, David, you said, um, you know, some of these cybersecurity frameworks, um, you, you could mandate their use or maybe not. Um, could you talk through a little bit about how um, what we're describing could be um, enforced or supervised or whether it should be at all. Right. Well, I think there are a number of ways to look at that. Um, the, the banking, the financial sector now has become very um, complex and diverse uh, with banks, fintechs, and microfinance institutions, um, embedded financial services in, in messaging systems and on and on and on. Um, and so the question is, how do you get a cohesive set of protections in place? Um, I think it can happen in a number of different ways. One is I think the central bank could sort of encourage that to happen and hope hope it will. It will. Um, one other model that we had you know, years ago in the U.S. was the central bank, the Federal Reserve Board, issued regulations that were then enforced by other agencies like the Federal Trade Commission over non-banks. So you could have one rule writer um, and then different enforcers. Um, and then, as you know, uh, over time in the U.S., we've we've moved to a, a, a entity that. Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, 
uh, there's jurisdiction over both banks and non-banks uh, for financial services. So I think there are different models um, that are going to each one, one may be appropriate to a different country. Uh, but I think the key thing is the cyber threat is real. Um, and I think we need a, a cohesive response to it. Um, because again, from the financial inclusion point of view, we, you talk about trust and confidence. We need poor people to be confident that the services will protect their money and their data um, and make sure it, it's being used to benefit them. Thank you. And Sop, is it a requirement? I want to ask two questions. I apologize. Is it first, is it a requirement for banks to, will it be a requirement for them to use the EKYC utility? And how do you think about supervision, like you said, liability related to it? Um, and then do you have any concerns from like a broad cybersecurity perspective of kind of this, this centralized point of failure by having um, MAS play that role? Yes. Uh, I mean, look, there are, um, we provide a consumer a choice whether they can use the public utility or they can follow the normal process, go to a branch with a bunch of document, putting your signature if you are comfortable. I want to emphasize choice is, is very essential in this journey. You cannot force people to use electronic data systems if they're not comfortable because people come from different uh, background, literacy level. There is a need to provide that safety mechanism for the transition. So we should not get over excited about a uh, public utilities, everything touch and electronic. So that is one part. So today in Singapore, every customer is going to choose how they want to go for. Of course, they get a, they do prefer electronic way to go. I think your question around the data breaches. I think once the data moves from a public utility to a bank, at that point of time, bank is accountable for maintaining the privacy, uh, protecting the data. Two days back, we we actually past a more stricter regulation, you can Google, where I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, up, up, if there's a data breach, up to 10% of annual turnover will be fined or $1 million, whichever is higher. This is one of the most stiffest penalty, I, I, to my knowledge, in this space. We just came a couple of days back. Uh, uh, while we do encourage there's a better use of data uh, in terms of uh, uh, with the proper consent and legitimate business use, but same time, we want to bring the accountability back to the firms which are taking the data and, and processing the data. On your third question around liability and uh, who is accountable if the data source is bad? I think that's a big question. I think for that, uh, there's, a, there's a collective uh, agreement between all the parties, which is in this case, myself as a citizen, the infrastructure and my, the source of data. We all collectively come to a state where we agree that this is generally speaking a golden source data. Uh, and and I, I think the ownership the, uh, and the, the likelihood of this data going bad is perhaps it's somewhere else, not on the system and the processes. So there is that uh, evolving process going around. In fact, uh, at an individual level, it's much easier. It gets very complex when it becomes corporate data because there the ownership is multiple. Owners may not be sitting in Singapore. They may be sitting somewhere else. It becomes far more complex when it comes to corporate data uh, infrastructure and consent associated with that. So it is still an evolving process. Uh, I think it, we need to work out uh, how we st st strengthen the, the whole legal framework progressively. But if you try to fix uh, all this thing at the, at the onset, very difficult to move forward. Caitlin, can I um, <clears throat> add to that? Um, Sam mm -hmm. made the uh, point about responsibility for um, data breaches. Um, I think another way to approach this would be liability, having the provider assume liability for fraudulent transactions, <clears throat> which is, as you know, the way it's done in the United, at least in the United States on credit cards and debit cards is the consumer does not bear the risk of loss um, on yes. those cards. And, yes. and this was adopted, I think, in 1970. It wasn't obvious to the credit card industry that it would be wonderful for them to assume their customer's liability. Um, I think it is uh, absolutely probably the best thing that ever happened to the credit card industry. Uh, because it made you yes. confident um, and that you wouldn't walk out on the street with a credit card if you were responsible for your full credit limit. <clears throat> so I think, and, and, most, and even more importantly, it puts the burden on the part of the entity who can best control what's going on. And the credit card industry has done an amazing job at reducing fraud. Um, and, and I think that's a lesson to be learned outside of the credit card system to other payment systems is assume, put the liability where it's, it makes the most sense in terms of creating incentives and, and less on the people least able to afford the loss of money.
And just, just quickly add very quick uh, on David's point. In fact, that's uh, what you call Consumer Protection Act. In fact, the credit card actually forced a shift of using chip as a liability shift if you don't use it. And uh, that's also it incentivized people to shift to a higher protection card structure. But that's all and fine on a credit card. What happens to the debit card? What about an ATM card fraud? What happens to a bank transfer which goes bad? Uh, so there is a whole set of Consumer Protection Act coming as we speak. There are certain liability coverage being given, minimal small value transport to be protected. So yeah, that is a credit card is a great uh, precedence to pick other part of the money uh, transfer risk uh, as we think about consumer protection. Thank you. That was great. Um, Sid, I want to jump to you then. And could you kind of uh, explain the role of public entities like the Reserve Bank of India or others in enforcing some of the, um, or not enforcing some of the new um, architecture and standards, especially around consumer protection, liability and risk, like we've been talking about. Yeah, so uh, the Central Bank in India, uh, RBI, uh, has played a pivotal role in that. Uh, they've essentially been made uh, the nodal agency uh, for the, so India has four financial sector regulators. So you have RBI for banking, SEBI for securities, PFRDA for pension funds, and IRDA for insurance. And each of these sectors have their own individual data sets. And therefore, RBI has been made the nodal agency uh, for driving data empowerment in the country. And uh, the first step for doing that was actually adopting a common consent taxonomy such that, you know, every entity, when it receives the consent request from the individual, uh, they're able to interpret it in a standardized manner. Uh, the second was actually laying off technical standards in place. So RBI notified uh, Pan-India standards around uh, when you receive a consent, what is the data that gets shared? Uh, how does it get shared? So India actually has national APIs uh, for consented data sharing that every bank or pension fund or insurer or even telecom company, these are very generalized APIs, uh, can adopt and implement. And that makes the rollout uh, much safer, more secure, uh, and also operationally a lot easier uh, uh, for the different entities that are involved. Uh, because if you have competing standards, like it is in the case of the EU and UK, uh, it makes the rollout extremely difficult. So along with notifying these technical standards, and, and these are all open standards that anyone can adopt, what RBI also did was license uh, the consent managers. So a key part of India's architecture, when you think about it uh, at the scale of a billion people, uh, each of whom need to have the ability to give informed consent, right? That means, uh, you know, like SOP mentioned, consent could be shown to me in a structured manner in a screen. But for a large part of India, uh, for whom they don't have access to a smartphone or any digital device and they have an assisted journey, right? You need a different mechanism using the same infrastructure to collect their consent in a way that's far more accessible and adaptable to their needs. So therefore, it was imperative that as India unbundled consent from the custodian of data, which is traditionally how data sharing would take place, and it never, it didn't give it to the consumer of data, which is the architecture, let's say in Australia or the EU, where the app that's consuming your data also collects your consent. Uh, and you know we've seen the rep repercussions of that through Cambridge Analytica. Um, India unbundled it from both ends and placed it into a third party fiduciary entity, uh, which are the account aggregators. And therefore, given the scale of this country, uh, we couldn't have just one account aggregator. And therefore, RBI couldn't place a licensing regime uh, with which a range of companies could apply. So you could be a corporate, you could be a startup. Uh, if you met the, the specific requirements, uh, RBI had an extensive process around giving them in principle approvals and now four of these have an operational license. So they put in place essentially an enabling framework uh, for these actors to participate uh, through the licensing regime as well as through technical standards. Uh, at this stage, they haven't actually mandated uh, the institutions to adopt the system. And I think that's also very key. Uh, but as we speak, the largest banks in India, so hundreds of millions of bank accounts are now being available, made available electronically uh, through this consented system. And that's because the individual actors are coming on board, the banks and others are coming on board because this system benefits them as well. It widens market access because you can now create 
uh, sachetized products. And so therefore, by putting in place the enabling framework, but at the same time, you know, not taking the hammer approach like the, like the case of the EU, uh, where they mandated it. Uh, and in India, it was also a uh, approach from a point of view of inclusion and not competition. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't, hey, everyone, open up your data. Let's make this market more competitive. Uh, but it was, you know, hey, everyone, uh, only 8% of our small businesses have access to formal financing, 8 to 10%. You know, only 30 million Indians have a thick file in a credit bureau. Uh, we've got to create uh, statutized financial products to at least give them a first leg up. And that's the reason why you see a lot of the incumbents and challengers uh, working together uh, in the operational rollout of this system. Now, of course, uh, this requires, no doubt, new capabilities uh, on the path of the central bank when it comes to supervisory and others, because, you know, traditionally, their domain has been in the area of monetary policy and related matters. Um, and those have to be built out. I think, you know, valid questions around enforcing data governance. Uh, how do you put in place audits so that you ensure that the regulated entities only use data for the purpose with which it was shared? And what happens when this framework extends beyond regulated entities? Because, you know, as an individual, I should have a right to share my data securely with any service provider uh, in the country or across countries as well. Um, and then what happens uh, 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 to, you know, enforceability in, in that case? So those are open questions that have to be thought about. Uh, you know, as we move from the next phase of, uh, 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 as we move towards the next phase of uh, mass market consumer adoption. Um, can, if I could add in, jump in, um, I, this, this conference is focusing on central banks of the future. And I guess one question is, why do we have credit bureaus at all in the present? Uh, we have massive databases um, uh, covering hundreds of millions of people in some places. Um, which are targets for cyber criminals to to get information. When you when you aggregate that much data in one location, it's a, a huge risk. Um, and in a networked environment, why do we need credit bureaus at all? Uh, and something that hasn't been mentioned is India's um, creation of digital lockers, uh, where people can store their own data. And perhaps what we should do is have companies report to each individual's digital locker in a digitally signed way, so that individuals could truly control their credit report and all their other data about them, and then consent on a granular basis as to who gets access to that information. Uh, and that way, there's a security breach that's not, maybe it's one person's data, but it's not the entire system. We saw the Equifax breach of a couple of years ago with over 100 million people's fun and data was compromised in a digital locker environment. Um, you wouldn't have that situation. And then people could check their credit information at any time, day or night, um, to see what goes on. And then they could authorize um, through consent as to who has access to it. So I think I think in the future we should take advantage of technology and, and not resort to state massive databases, which made sense back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, but don't make sense um, on a going forward in the 21st or 22nd century. And David, in, in that kind of scenario, I think one thing that's interesting between um, Singapore and India is that ability of MAS to actually hold some of the liability for the quality and the correctness of the information that it's storing. So in a scenario in which we um, have these kind of personal lockers, would central banks play a role in actually assuming some liability or would that continue to be on, let's say, um, the entities that are generating the data originally? Well, um, the central banks could assume essentially responsibility for the system working properly um, and that on an on a everyday basis, it should really be a dispute between the individual and the entity that provided the data. And you want to <clears throat> be sensitive to regulatory capacity challenges anywhere in the world um, and not, not have the central bank get involved where they don't need to, uh, but where there are systemic problems of accuracy, of how long the data is retained, and how it's protected. And I think the central bank can play an important enforcement and supervision role, uh, but in the everyday operational system, it ought to operate mostly on its own. I, I just want to clarify, I think the central bank doesn't want liability in this sense, but they provide the notice required for the banks to use a certain set of data as a golden source. So the liability still is within the system, not at the central bank, because it's not possible that way. Uh, there is a notice which you ensure that that's a reasonable, good place to pull the data, and they will not be penalized for pulling the data. I think that's that's the cover you get. Um, so I think that's something. Uh, and also the quick point on the notion of 
as utilities. I think there's an implicit understanding utility is a centralized place. One cyber attack, life is done. I, I just want to clarify that in this in the case of example in Singapore, actually the mind for and the data are gateways. They're actually not the database. 11 plus agencies are actually holding the actual source of data. And on, the, on a real time, you're pulling data from each agency based on what data are looking for. So you actually don't get to attack a single system for uh, taking all the data. In fact, the, if at all there's a consolidated data, it's with, it's with the banks themselves. And that's why they have to go through a very rigorous uh, Data Protection Act. Yeah, and that's the, the same in India, correct, Sid? In terms of the DigiLocker as well, these are all just kind of pipes and nodes rather than one centralized database. Um, so moving on, yes, I absolutely. want- Yes, absolutely. And in fact- Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, and in fact, you know, uh, as David mentioned, uh, given that uh, the bureaus were created in a world uh, where it was required to centralize data since it was all physically collected. Uh, but now that we are all collected, connected over a network, uh, you can imagine a paradigm where uh, your credit information is fetched in real time um, straight from source in a decentralized manner and that reduces a significant vector of attacks. Um, so I want to move now, when we talk about kind of these utility systems, um, to think about who actually builds them. You know, does do public entities build them or do they create standards and incentives for private companies to kind of facilitate that? Um, so maybe, Sid, we could start with you because in India there is kind of a standard setting and then private entities are actually kind of creating the network itself. Um, so maybe you could describe that choice and then SOP um, maybe kind of any role that MAS is playing in actually building the technology side um, for the EKYC. Yeah. So the way we look at it in India is, uh, you know, essentially uh, a jugal bandi, uh, a partnership, that's a Hindi term for partnership between public infrastructure and private innovators on top. So what we do know is at scale, given the diversity of solutions that are required uh, by these various individuals and businesses, uh, no one government app, one government portal, one government service, uh, or one private sector app, portal, service is going to satisfy the needs across the country. Uh, and keeping in mind that a lot of individuals uh, have very low levels of income, per capita income, uh, it's critical that you put in place infrastructure that lowers the transaction cost, uh, thus making it economically viable for companies to reach there. And so therefore, India has gone down the path of building out a set of public goods. And these public goods take the shape of specifications, right? So in the case of payments, there is a payment specification through which uh, you can transact in a real time manner using any consumer app. Uh, same is the case of data. Now, these specifications are adopted by specific, like by a range of entities. In the case of data, those specifications have been adopted by the account aggregators uh, and the providers of data and the consumers of data. Uh, and the account aggregators, since they are the ones mediating this flow, kind of like a postman, uh, and they are the ones licensed by RBI, they drive the network creation. Now, they don't own the specification. They're operating on the back of you know, the central bank's uh, policy and these open standards. And they just play the role of building out the infrastructure and operating it. Uh, and creating a nice experience for the front end consumer. So even if you, when you, to unbundle this word of utility, because utility kind of implies, you know, this one service, one provider, uh, you have a layer of specifications. Those are the open standards. Those are the public goods that are laid out. Uh, much like, you know, HTTP is a specification on top of which people create, private innovators created the browser or SMTP is for email. And that's been the real focus. And then you will have a set of players that operate the system uh, on the back end, a set of players that build out front end experiences for the consumers. Uh, and then, of course, the rest of it in terms of uh, auditors for data governance practices and so on. So that's the approach that India has taken, uh, uh, kind of this unbundled uh, uh, manner, so to speak. And this, uh, baked in these specifications are very core principles of interoperability. So, for example, one of the principles of interoperability are that uh, as a consumer, I can go to any account aggregator and link any 
uh, custodian of mine. So, you know, I could be banking with, let's say, bank ABC and then XYZ. Uh, and the account aggregator does not get into bilateral partnerships with them. Uh, because if they did, then let's say one account aggregator partnered with one bank, the other partner with a different bank. As a consumer, if I have my data residing in two banks, that becomes a very fragmented experience. So baked into these specifications are these principles of interoperability, reciprocity, which is unless you contribute data, you cannot consume it. Um, and that allows for the creation of a level playing field uh, on top of which a range of these companies and uh, middleware providers and end data consumers get built. And Saab, how does it work with MAS? I mean, what is the role of your organization in actually building and run and continuously running so, these rails? Uh, we have a, a couple of uh, structural advantage here because we have a very efficient government technology infrastructure, which is shared by all agencies, including MAS. So they are a shared utility. They put in market infrastructure, public rails. We are the governance agency for the sector. So we put the governance, the regal, the regulatory uh, umbrella around those 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 service those data being used by our sector, and then the consumer of the such data, which are the banks themselves. But different it, utility has a different structure. When it comes to payment rail, it is run by the banks, uh, in, uh, and 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 it is a shared utility. When it comes to uh, uh, data infrastructure, it is a infrastructure run by the government uh, technology uh, department but different agencies provide data set so that data can be shared and MAS provides the regulatory framework but when it comes to bank banking data itself we we actually pursue very interesting uh, uh, principle that only a contributing party can also consume the data which means that I can only participate in data exchange if I'm contributing to data only. I cannot be only consuming, which means if, if, two, if, there's a, if we have an API gateway, if two banks are contributing to the data, both two banks are participating, both are supposed to contribute as they also take data from each other. So this is to ensure level playing field. We don't want to be in a situation where somebody, a big tech comes and sucks all the data and contributes nothing. Imagine if uh, one of the big tech actually goes to public utility, takes all the bank's data, but they don't contribute themselves, all, all the data they collect themselves. So it will be unfair practice on the on the, on the the recipient banks in, the, in this construct. So we, we, we practice that equitable uh, participation of ownership and data contribution. So that's the structure for the transactional data. And I think a, a critical part of what, what both the panelists are saying is that uh, a, the government can establish a framework or technical standards, but still leave room for innovation and competition. Uh, because I think if it's all run by the government, there may not be as much incentive to be creating new services, new analytical tools. Um, and so I think the partnership between the government, making sure things are interoperable and that appropriate standards are maintained, like in India, the uniform payment interface, I think is brilliant because it, it's a very efficient system, but people can build uh, APIs on top of it. Um, is, is the right kind of balance to strike between uh, making sure things work, um, but also letting the private sector be as creative and innovative as possible. And, and David, I think one key part also, regulation also has to unbundle themselves because large part of uh, regulations are still an entity-based regulation. They're not activity-based regulation, which perhaps is the big elephant in the room because uh, you, can, you can create data, you can disaggregate data, which creates different innovation of services but the regulation which they comply to is the one big box. So you need to have an unbundled regulatory co construct to be innovative on such data opportunity. Yeah, I think you want to be technology neutral on your regulations. Um, I mean, you can look back at setting encryption standards, which may have made sense five years ago or even yesterday, uh, but won't make sense tomorrow. Um, yes. But you're right also, but then you're also in challenging what the regulatory structure should look like um, to make sure there's a uniform playing field yes. between fintechs and uh, big banks and payment yes. systems and mobile money. Um, yes. Uh, um, so that I think that's also a challenge is to make sure because you, you can have a fabulous infrastructure, but the single regulation entity can just kill the innovation. Right. And can you both speak also to the capabilities within regulators? I mean, David, you mentioned kind of, you know, 
an awareness of this technology, ability to use this technology potential. Um, could you, David, first speak to a little bit how you think about um, having those technological capabilities and awareness inside of regulators uh, and then any kind of partnerships that are going on uh, in India and Singapore? Well, one thing I guess I would mention is our proposal to create regional cybersecurity resource centers, which in part reflects the, the challenge regulators face who haven't grown up on cybersecurity and technology there. They do an excellent job on safety and soundness and prudential regulation, <clears throat> but not so much <clears throat> on cyber, which is not something that they had a reason to be familiar with. And so what we see these centers as being tools for the regulator to say, here are best regulatory practices where you focus on uh, risk assessment and mitigation. Um, and instead of uh, being prescriptive and barring someone else's rules, you make rules that make sense for your country, your ecosystem. Um, and so we see that as really a partnership between these centers. And the centers, as far as we're concerned, could be private, public-private um, uh, entities, um, but essentially give the regulators some assistance um, and how to regulate in this space because it's an ever-growing challenge. And Sid, how does it work in India? You know, it, how do you guys think about um, blending private knowledge potentially around technology with um, public utilities? Yeah. So, you know, we see two uh, institutional structures emerge. Uh, one is the notion of, you know, technical standards organizations. So these are the ones that interface with a range of market participants and put in place these open standards and evolve these open standards. Um, and then the second is self-regulatory organizations. Uh, these are the ones that are actually working with uh, both the uh, regulator on one end as well as the market participants on the other. And they are essentially laying in place the operational guidelines of the ecosystem, uh, the best practices, uh, certification, a lot of the finer grained enforcement uh, that's done. Uh, uh, much like, you know, along the lines of, let's say, in the internet space, uh, the role of Wi-Fi alliance would play or the Bluetooth alliance, right? Uh, they put in place a standard, they ensure that all the participants meet the highest quality levels, it's interoperable, the consumers have a safe, secure, exp smooth experience. And so therefore we do see, uh, in the case of the account aggregator ecosystem, there's an SRO called Sahamati, uh, uh, which is formed by a range of these market players. Uh, essentially to manage the operational aspects uh, of the ecosystem in a lot more fine-grained way. And then interact not just, of course, with the central bank, but as I mentioned, this is cross-sectoral. So you've got, you know, regulators in insurance, pension funds, telecom. And so therefore, they become an agency that interacts with all the others as well uh, to manage the rollout. Thank you. And, and Saab, you already mentioned kind of the, the significant technical capabilities, it sounds like, of MAS and, and kind of all of the regulatory system. Um, but any lessons learned from um, getting kind of staff and, and regulatory capability up to the level uh, to manage these systems? Well, look, uh, I, I thank my I have a job with the regulator because they want somebody like me to work for them in the space of technology uh, to have a fancy title called Chief Fintech Officer. Uh, so that's uh, five years back. Uh, now, uh, yes, absolutely, it's uh, it's necessary for regulators to upgrade their ca capacity to understand the implication of technology. But having said that, uh, it, there's a limit to how much they can upgrade. So what we have done in Singapore, which has been effective for us, is something we call as an ecosystem ap approach. And I use this uh, acronym called INNER approach, which is I stands for innovation, N stands for a network of, of, of partners, and E stands for ecosystem, and R, of course, the regulation. Now, how does it help? Because uh, it helps into expanding your own bench strength by tapping into the industry bench strength. And having that part of your construct, a part of your network helps to uh, upgrade your own skill set, also get industry to respond. Uh, and, and, the, and the reason I, a quick example, uh, when we started in 2015, uh, we had to put a massive set, almost 500 page of documentation on the API guidelines. So, you know, you, you start doing all this thing, it takes time to build the capacity and together with the industry, the regulators can build a better uh, capacity to handle such uh, evolving challenges and opportunities. By the way, just to David's point, uh, while regulators are known for 
KYC, AML, Consumer Protection, Financial Stability, they do have something, they get criticized a lot. They have something called Tech Risk Management Guidelines, which you can always question they were draconian, but they have something out like that, which kind of addresses with David's concern around cyber risk outsourcing guidelines. Um, I also wanted to add, I guess, the SOP's point about the ecosystem is that, that we can't just focus on the bank. Uh, we can't just focus on, we have to focus on the switch um, and the interoperability switches, the international system correspondent banking. Um, it's a very complex world and it's important to look at all the different components of them, uh, both from, from regulatory point of view, particularly in cyber, but, but, but more broadly on information flow. Um, it's, not, it's not a simple world of just the regulator and, and the financial institution. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, I'm increasingly thinking about the interconnectivity, interconnectivity needed within institutions um, to handle all these new systems and, and requirements, and then that interconnectivity across the world within countries um, between regulators. Um, uh, so, I can add just briefly is uh, yeah. to not forget that the central bank um, has data that's at risk as well. That is, not only is it a supervisor, but it holds very sensitive data, supervisory data, monetary policy data, and it's important that the central banks protect themselves uh, as well as their the entities over which they have jurisdiction. We had a call um, when we started this project from a central a governor of a central bank saying, my central bank was hacked, what do I do? Um, and so um, it's important to think of them both as customers and as regulators. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so this has been fascinating and, and quite enjoyable. Um, so I want to just end with seeing if anyone else has any kind of final comments or um, lessons around inclusion, security, um, or technology based on what we've talked about. Uh, I have a quick point that we spoke mostly about domestic market. I think uh, one of the one of the un unmet need in this space is that all the systems were designed to make our domestic market efficient may have some challenge when they start connecting with other market. I think that's something we got to carefully look at because the designs we are making should not make it in, uh, uninteroperable when we start collecting, connecting them cross-border, be it payment, be it data, be it ID. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why we have uh, events like these where we can talk to each other, hopefully, and, and think about how all these new systems we're building will hopefully talk to other countries uh, and each other as everything becomes more connected. Um, wonderful. Well, with that, I'll conclude the panel and thank you all so much. Um, next up is a, a regulatory perimeter panel that I think will touch on a lot of these concepts in terms of um, security and jurisdiction uh, and capabilities within regulators. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.